kind of easy to call the witch. They're not itchy like um, they call they had no call the witch. Only the call the witch. Okay, I need you to uh, clean up your artwork. Okay, but let me and then then brush. brush. Effective political effort within the law. Thank, thank you, Mr. Fisher. And now we turn to Mr. Kunstler for his rebuttal argument in support of massive civil disobedience. Well, I wish Tip O'Neill had been here so we could cross-examine him on that statement. But since he is not, I would like to, before calling my rebuttal witness, indicate that we are going to try to prove through this witness that civil disobedience <laughs> is not what the others have said, but is a viable political tactic and a non-violent tactic. <laughs> to do that, I would like to call Howard Zinn to the stand. Welcome to the advocates, Professor Zinn. Howard Zinn is an historian, an old friend of mine, I believe a client somewhere along the way, and he's been involved in civil disobedience both in the South and against the war in Vietnam. Professor Zinn, why civil disobedience today? Why not wait for what our adversary witnesses have said, the normal processes of government, to catch up with the war in Vietnam? Why do you call him Al and me Professor Zinn? <laughs> You're a client.
Congressman, the President, the Congressman, the Senator, the uh, listening to Congressman O'Neill, and they all talk as if the political process were a quite simple one, and that is that if everybody would just be nice and talk nice to your congressman, write him letters, write letters to the newspaper, sign petitions, that the war in Vietnam would end, the bombers would be brought home, the GIs would be brought home, and the power-hungry American military establishment uh, would lose its hunger. That's not the way things have happened in this war, and that's not the way things have happened in history. Throughout American history, the political leaders have always exhorted the American people to be nice and quiet and leave things to them. But when very serious evils confronted the American people, they had to go beyond the congressmen and the senators, and they had to commit civil disobedience, and they had even to break the law. And the abolitionists had to do it. And right here in Boston, they had to violate federal law by trying to bring the slave uh, away from the federal marshals. They had to commit civil disobedience. Uh, the labor movement had to do this. They had to violate the They had to disrupt things. They had to do all sorts of impolite things. They had the sit-ins of uh, sit-down strikes of 1936 and 37. And only this finally brought that modicum of justice that the labor movement demanded. And the civil rights movement went through the same thing. And you know, the Congress did not act on the civil rights laws of 63, uh, of 64 and 65 until blacks went out into the streets and made a commotion. They did not do it on the basis of some polite discourse. And that, <laughs> yeah. for a minute, I want to get, before we run out of time, out of time I want to get to one point.
and Senator Hart and Tip O'Neill have made promises to us tonight. They've said if we wait and don't disrupt Congress and don't get people excited and irritated, then they will end the war in Vietnam by December, according to Mr. O'Neill, by some other date. Why not wait and make them live up to the promissory note they've made? We have had promissory notes from Congress for six years. For six years, Congress has promised to preserve our lives, our liberties, and have promised to defend the Constitution of the United States, which is an oath that they took. For six years, Congress violated that oath, as the President violated that oath, by carrying on and acceding to a constitutional war. Mr. O'Neill, who exhorts us to quietude and uh, obeisance to law, voted for every single military appropriation bill of 21 military appropriation bills brought up before Congress between 1965 and 1970, he voted for every single one of them. No, I don't think we can depend on Congress. In the American political system, you know, we have brought, been brought up to believe that the American political system works beautifully. It is democratic. Congress represents us. The president is elected. He represents us. It doesn't work that way. Democracy depends on people speaking out and in times of great crisis on people creating a commotion. Garrison once said when they accused him of breaking the law, of disrupting things, of antagonizing people, he said, slavery, sir, will not be overthrown without excitement.
Harrison made that statement, as quoted by you in your book. He said, we do not have public opinion on our side, so we must act. Today, on the issue of Vietnam, we have public opinion. Just who is this organized, disruptive tactic designed to influence? The organized, disruptive tactic that you keep describing as disruptive, that's uh, what you're of course. Dropping bombs on Hanoi is not a way of producing effective political action. But we're dropping you bombs seem to, every day in Vietnam. I know, and you seem to think that the same strategy at home is the one to pursue. I'm disagreeing. The same that, strategy? Yes. I'm not suggesting dropping bombs. The United bombs. States is wrecking havoc in Hanoi, action. and you favor wrecking havoc in Washington.
people who want military victory. You are saying which act now, according to your conscience. Will you let me answer, please? Uh, I can't tell the people who want military victory, which is now a minority of the American people. Oh, <laughs> 
to do. But that great majority of the American people who are now are opposed to the war should do everything that they are impelled by their conscience to do. And you need to recognize that some people are impelled by their conscience to write to their congressmen, and other people are impelled by their conscience to go to Washington and to say to the people in the government offices, stop work, disobey, because the violence of our time is caused by obedience. Now, let me just finish my point. What we are trying to do in Washington is not to tell everybody in the country to do exactly what we're doing. What we're trying to do in Washington is to tell people in the country that they need in their own way to disobey the government in every... GIs to disobey the call to war, young people to disobey the draft induction yeah, notice. That's what we <laughs>
consequences, we will impose those. That is the prescription which others have followed. In the Weimar Republic, Hitler followed that. A now, short response from Professor Zinn, and then we're going to have to close it. A very short response. This is, this is not the Weimar Republic. This is the United States in 1971. It's a good time to have Professor Zinn. I'm afraid I'm going to have to. <laughs> Thank you very, very sorry. much. <laughs> Oh, God.